She's a member of the BSG and she's the deputy editor of Aging in Society. In today's workshop, she'll tell us everything we need to know about writing for publication. Thank you, Athena. Can I just remind everybody to keep your, um, your audios on mute? And if you have questions, please post them in the chat. And then at the end of the presentation, we'll open it up and we can use the raise hand feature as well. So thank you very much, Athena, over to you. Thank you, Heather, very much. Uh, welcome everyone, good afternoon. First of all, a big thank you to Heather uh, for the invitation and to Matthew as well. I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to be giving this session as part of the BSG community, uh, which is where I started from as well. So today's session is um, on writing for publication. Um, I'd like it to be a, an informal session in the sense that I'm going to be uh, completely honest with you about my experience as part of an editorial team. Um, and, I, and I also encourage you, even if I say things that you know already, to, to use this opportunity to ask questions, whether it is through the chat, during the talk, um, or at the end. So I'll, I'll try to speak for about half an hour so that we have to, enough time for uh, questions at the end. Um, just one more thing to say that the presentation today is obviously drawing on my role as, as one of the two deputy editors. Uh, Martin Hyde, my colleague, is the other one uh, for the journal Aging and Society. Um, but what I would like to talk about really relates to publishing in general, um, in the area of aging, but I think a lot of the tips relate to publishing per se, rather than specifically in the journal that I have experience uh, with. So I've been in the editorial team for uh, six years or so, um, and so everything I will talk about is, is based on that experience, okay? So what are we going to talk about today? Um, I'd like to say a few words about the actual process and apologies for those of you who are already well aware of that process. There are some differences between different journals, but more or less that's how it works. Um, and then I guess for me, the most important part of today is, is the tips for publishing a paper. So this is based on, on my experience, both as, as an author trying to get published and as someone who is part of an editorial team. Uh, and then at the end, Hopefully I'll spend just a few minutes on reviewing for a journal, which I think is really important because it's the other side of the coin, just as you expect for your paper to be reviewed. So you may have the opportunity to review a paper yourself. So it's really important to, uh, to take both tasks uh, seriously and, and, and develop skills in both tasks. And then at the end, we'll take some questions and answers. Okay, so uh, let me start with a, just a descriptive pro process of the, of the review. So this is a, a kind of a, a path that is followed by most journals, that, uh, including Aging in Society. So once the paper is submitted, it is then checked by an administrator. Um, I didn't say at the beginning, if you have burning questions for clarification, please feel free to interrupt me. Otherwise, we can talk about it at the end. The checking by the administrator is really important um, because essentially it's the it's the first hurdle where one's paper could fall. So it's really important to uh, follow the, the the format and the guidelines of the specific journal you want to submit your paper to, because those format formatting guidelines will be checked at the very first stage. And it is um, it, it is almost a shame for a paper to be sent back to the authors just because they didn't follow the format. So it is really important to, to pass this check by the administrator. The administrator then usually allocates the paper to an editor and that allocation can be both in terms of workload because we are a team managing a certain number of uh, manuscripts submitted, but also in terms of uh, expertise. So in the aging and society team, for example, some of us have expertise in specific methodologies or specific substantive areas, but at the same time, there is a, a workload distribution that has to be taken into account. 
The next step is for the reviewers to be selected by the editor and contacted. Now, I want to, to, to spend just a few seconds on this one because I think for all of us, the past 12 months have been quite challenging uh, in terms of performing our duties and uh, balancing lots, lots of obligations as well as taking care of our own health. So in terms of selecting and uh, uh, successfully recruiting reviewers, that past year has been has been more challenging than usual. Um, so we really rely on academics just like you and me to to take up some time and review papers. And it's a really important part of the process, because if somebody uh, declines to review a paper for whatever reason, then it comes back to the editor to find new suggestions for reviewers. And that can take time. So it is an important part of the process. Hopefully, if all goes well, the reviews are then submitted within a specified time by the reviewers. Um, and then based on those reviews, it is up to the editor or, um, uh, or associate editor to make a recommendation uh, or a decision. Hopefully, um, it, and in some cases, it will be revised and resubmit. Um, I, I will say a few words about this at the very end, but it is the best the best outcome that you can hope for in uh, in today's uh, climate is a revise and resubmit decision and i'll be honest about that because in the past uh, say six six years that i've been involved in the team um, i don't believe i have ever recommended the acceptance of a paper without any revisions at all um, and the reason is because we're all social scientists and uh, you, you can always improve a paper and make it a little bit better and a little bit clearer. So the best you can hope for uh, as an outcome is, is revise and resubmit. In, in some cases, it is reject, of course, uh, without even sending it out for uh, review. That's called a desk rejection. Um, and I'll come back to this point in the next slide. If it is uh, reject, it is the end of the road for that journal. Uh, I'm afraid, um, and then the author usually takes takes it away and, and submits it in another journal. If it is revised and resubmit, uh, then the author is invited to revise the paper according to the comments. Usually there's also some comments from the editor, not just the reviewers. And sometimes if the editors have a hard time obtaining uh, a couple of reviews, sometimes they will act as a second detailed reviewer, which is, uh, as I said in the last 12 months, has been necessary uh, in order to keep the review process going. Um, so if it's a revise and resubmit, usually the authors are expected to resubmit the paper within a, a time period, and authors can negotiate that time if they feel they need a little bit more time, but usually it is um, a few weeks for minor corrections and it could be up to six months for major corrections. And then it is up, the, when the paper comes back, again, it is up to the editor to make a decision about whether to send it back to the reviewers for another read or whether to make a decision at that point. If it is sent back to the reviewers for another round of reviews, then uh, th th the same process happens again. So the review, we have to wait for the reviews to come back and then uh, the author has to uh, make changes and revise and resubmit. If it is accepted after one or two, sometimes even after three rounds of revisions, but very rarely, um, then it is accepted, hopefully, and the proofs are sent to the author. And then just a final couple of stages to say that uh, in, in most journals, the paper is published online in the first instance. Um, and is allocated uh, what is called a DOI, a digital object identifier. So that means that the paper has an identity in the online world. And then usually a few months later, it could be up to 10, 11 months later, the paper is published in print. So it, it's, a, it's a complicated process, as you see, uh, with a few stages where the ball is in the court of the authors or the ball is in the court of the of the editors, but the review process actually relies on all of these uh, uh, stages being fulfilled before a paper can be published. I may be oversimplifying some of these stages, and 
if you have questions about any of these stages, you can you can ask me in the chat or later on. But more or less, this is how the the uh, review process works. Right, tips for publishing a paper. So from my perspective, this is the most important part of today's talk. Um, so I'll go through each of those tips, safety words, and then, as I said, please come back to me with questions if you want at the end. So the first and perhaps obvious uh, tip is to choose the journal well. Um, and for my PhD students, I always say that you should start with your own references, with your own reference list, because the chances are that the journals that you have used for your own research are good destinations for your own research to be published, okay? And this relates to a, a later point as well, but that's a good place to start. Um, the second is to check the journal scope. And again, some of you may think, well, it's obvious that that journal would publish my work, but actually every journal has a remit and a scope, and it is important to take time and go on the website and just check that your research roughly fits within it. Um, I'll give you an example in, in my role in aging and society. Occasionally, very occasionally, I have received a paper which is quite medical. Uh, there's a lot of oscopies uh, and isms in the paper. And it is, it is difficult to see how kind of a broad multidisciplinary but social sciences journal can, uh, can, can engage with the paper and the audience can engage. So it is really important to, to check the journal scope uh, and just make sure that your paper and your discipline and your, your use of theories and, and literature fit with the journal scope. Another piece of advice is to download a couple of published articles in that journal. Uh, in your own topic area. And that can be really useful because you can see how other authors have structured the material. Sometimes the literature review comes in one big blog because it is the same body of literature. Sometimes it is necessary to have two or three subheadings because they help the reader to flow from one part of the literature to another. So it, it's always useful to download a couple of papers from authors in, in your broad area, just to make sure that the structure is, is similar to what you're trying to do. You don't have to copy paste it, but you can get a sense of how other people writing in that area have thought about um, and successfully published a paper on that topic. D, very, very important. I would have put it as A, really, but it is really important to follow the journal guidelines and format. Unfortunately, we don't live in an era where all the journals follow the same guidelines and format. There's advantages and disadvantages, but there are reasons for, for that. You know, some journals publish papers which are five, 6,000 words long. In aging in society, it's up to 9,000 words. Some journals require the abstract to have specific subheadings. Some journals allow you to have a paragraph without subheadings. It is really, really important to follow the guidelines because it shows the journal editors and the administrator who receives the paper that you are really thinking about targeting that journal. And although it wouldn't, it wouldn't result in a, in a desk rejection immediately, when I receive a paper which is clearly being prepared for a different journal, um, it, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't help with the review process and knowing that this, this author has prepared that paper for that journal. So it, it is important to spend time and, and follow the guidelines. And it will save you time later because part of the revisions, if your paper receives a revise and resubmit decision, will be about adjusting the guidelines and the format. And I, I always say to my PhD students, it's better to do it now rather than later because it gives a good first impression. First impressions do count. Um, and it doesn't take a huge amount of time. It's important to dedicate one or two days extra and submit the best you can submit at that moment in time. Okay, uh, E, ask your supervisor or mentor to give you feedback. Again, that's really important. I mean, the, the older I get, the more I think that asking for advice is more than okay. And, and it is true that when you're a PhD student, 
you you want to do your own thing you want to achieve things without help you want to prove yourself to your supervisor and to other colleagues that's absolutely fine but what i'm suggesting is that the smart thing to do is to also use your networks and also use your supervisor's experience or your senior mentor's experience especially if they have published in that specific journal um, and the worst thing that could happen is they can say no if they don't have time or if they're not available. But I think it's always worth asking for some feedback on a draft because you can always make it a little bit better. Coming back to the point of being in social science and wanting to improve your work bit by bit. Um, F, engaging with the journal's history on the topic. Now that relates to my next slide, but I, I want to emphasize how important that is to, to show the editors that you have really thought about targeting that specific journal because there is an ongoing conversation about your topic in that journal. Um, it doesn't mean you have to go over the top and reference uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, people who have published in that area in that journal in the past. But adding a little bit of your own contribution to the existing debate in that journal about your topic shows your scientific contribution as adding a little brick to that topic area. So it is important to engage with the journal um, and to take the time to search through uh, the contributions and to really think about what your paper adds to the existing area. Um, similarly, engaging with colleagues who have published in that topic, even if they're not your uh, supervisor or your uh, mentor, if there is someone that you know works in that area and you would like them to, to give you their opinion about your draft, there's no harm in asking. The downside of asking someone for advice, I have to say this, is that they might then uh, decline an invitation to formally review the paper because they have a conflict of interest, because they may have seen it in the past. So I, I would say that asking for advice is really important, but again, don't overdo it. I think asking your supervisor if you're doing your PhD is probably adequate, or asking your senior mentor if you've just finished your PhD and you're at the early stages of your career. Um, H, I also wanted to add this piece of advice because sometimes it is a key reason why papers are desk rejected, so they're not sent out to reviewers uh, in the first instance, because they are not clear about what the paper's contribution is. That's really, really important. You can have papers which are very nicely written, very fluent, they engage with the literature, but the one thing they don't tell us is what is new or original about the paper. And that is something that has to be there for the reader and the editor to see in the abstract, as soon as they read the abstract, as well as the rest of the paper, whether you do it in the introduction or the introduction and the discussion, you can do it in more than one place. But it is really important somewhere to make sure that you have included uh, a clear statement about what the paper's original contribution is. Um, and and it's, a, it's, it's a shame when you see really, really nicely written papers um, not go out for review for that reason, because it is not um, a difficult thing to do. But sometimes if you're very close to your PhD and to your own topic, you take it for granted that you know, of course, what is new about your PhD. But if you think of a reader who doesn't know you and hasn't read your topic, uh, then you can really start to, to, to think about how, how to construct that sentence. And then finally, revise and resubmit. If you are lucky enough to have a revise and resubmit decision, again, I would encourage you to, to ask your PhD supervisors feedback on how to respond. Now, for a lot of students, the, the first experience of responding to comments comes when they have the viva, the PhD viva, and they, you know, they receive uh, revisions or changes, and then they have to resubmit the revised thesis, explaining how they have uh, improved it or revised it, and addressing the examiner's uh, comments. This is a similar process. So when you uh, resubmit a paper, you are expected to uh, explain how you have addressed each comment, and in some ways it is a defense. 
you, you are expected to either explain why you have uh, made a decision or make a change and then make it clear where the change has taken place so that you make it easier for the reviewer to go through the points and convince them that you have taken their advice into account and that the end result is stronger than the original manuscript. I would say that um, that's even more important when you submit a revised and resubmitted uh, journal article compared to your to your PhD, because it, if you have one one shot at being published, it's really important to to convey to the reviewers that you have seriously taken their um, advice into account. Okay, it doesn't mean bending over backwards and doing everything they ask, but it does mean engaging seriously. And unless you have a reason not to, revising the paper and strengthening it along the lines of the reviewer's comment. Okay, so these are the tips for publishing a paper, um, and we can come back to them later. I wanted to say a little, a few words about the um, the impact factor, and apologies if you know all about what it is. So this is a list of the of the journals in the area of gerontology and geriatrics. Um, according to the impact factor, that's the latest uh, list. This is publicly available information showing you the, the ranking. Um, and you can see their aging in society is number 17 on the list uh, with an impact factor of 1.768 at the moment. Um, the reason I wanted to show you this is because um, for social sciences, generally speaking, and maybe colleagues who are on the call, I hope you will agree that in social sciences, generally, anything, any journal that has an impact factor around one or above one is a, is a really good journal to publish in. You will note in this list of journals that there's a lot of journals above aging in society, which have kind of medical or clinical uh, orientations. And that's the reason why I wanted to show you this list, because in kind of more medical uh, fields, there is a, a greater expectation and culture of, of referencing each other's work. And that is, um, that is the reason why the impact factor is, is much higher compared to kind of social sciences journals. But in, in general, I would say anything around one or just above one is probably a really good target for your, uh, for your paper. Now, I don't know if you know how the impact factor is calculated, so I'll just quickly show you the example of aging in society. Again, you can see the website at the bottom. This is uh, a website that you're welcome to go and explore, but it is basically a calculation based on the citations in the current year to items that were published in the uh, last two years uh, over the number of citable items in those two last years. So that's a, a calculation which gives you the number 1.768 at the end. The reason I wanted to show you this is because um, it relates to one of the points I made earlier about engaging with the debate on your topic in that particular journal. So the impact factor is basically a calculation which says that the more that the more journal articles are citing publications from the previous years in that journal, um, the better it is in the in the impact factor for the for that journal. So, by engaging in the debate in that journal on your topic area, you are contributing to the calculation of the impact factor for the future years, and that's important because impact factors do matter. Um, for, for, for career progression. They matter in terms of the academic impact of journal articles. So obviously the higher the impact factor, the more impressive it is for academics, especially if they're at the beginning of their academic career. But it, it, it is important to remember that it, by doing that, by, by citing and engaging in the debate within that journal, you are contributing to that calculation of the impact factor. And impact factors, like any indicator, they go up and down, they're not set in stone, and they are not the only thing that counts. You know, if you, if you have found yourself as a PhD student using a journal, a specific journal that has a, an impact factor lower than one, but obviously is the best home for your research, then that's the journal to apply to. 
So impact factor is not the only thing to consider. Um, contributing to the debate and having your paper published in a journal where your fellow colleagues who have already published in that area, that's where they are. I think that's probably more satisfying and more meaningful from a scientific point of view. Okay, there's a huge debate about impact factors and I'm happy to come back to it in our discussion. Okay, um, things to remember. Um, publishing <laughs> is difficult and I've written here, it's increasingly difficult. And I said, I'll be honest at the beginning, it is increasingly difficult because more people are submitting papers. Although there are more journals, uh, global journals, um, which are inviting submissions, not all of them are high quality, not all of them even have an impact factor. So there is great competition to get published, but that doesn't mean that one should not try. Okay, and I, I think that's really important because when you as a PhD student or as a postdoc or an early career researcher submit a paper which looks professional, it's in the format and it contributes to the debate, you are sending a message to the editorial team and to colleagues who work in that area that you want to be one of the people contributing to the debate. So it doesn't mean you shouldn't try, it is difficult, but you want to send a message that you want to be part of the debate in that specific area. Um, the second point to say, and I will put my hand up for this one, is that it is a subjective process, the review process. We're not computers. We are uh, human beings. We don't use algorithms to make decisions. And whenever human beings make decisions, it is subjective decisions. So if a reviewer says that your paper shouldn't be published, that's their opinion. Uh, and if a reviewer says that your paper should be published, again, that's their opinion. If it's rejected, it doesn't mean that your paper is not worthwhile. You may have chosen a, a, a journal which is not quite the right fit with your paper. Again, if it's accepted, it doesn't mean it's the best thing since sliced bread. Uh, it, it, it is a subjective opinion and you must remember uh, that this process is not the beginning and the end of your identity as an academic. Um, the third point to say is that the journal article is one of the ways of disseminating research, but it's not the only one. I'm sorry if I'm being obvious, but uh, you can write a book, you can get a contract and have a manuscript, you can write a blog, which will reach probably far more people uh, in a place like The Conversation, for example, very impactful blog. But a journal article has its own different impact. So it can be impactful directly, so your contribution to that debate, or indirectly uh, on your CV and counting towards your own career progression. Um, and the last thing to say, again, sorry if I'm stating the obvious, but nobody is born writing articles. Um, it's a skill and it's, I wouldn't say that it's a skill that you can perfect uh, as you become older, you know, two weeks ago, I had a paper uh, rejected after a review. I didn't share the view of the reviewers, but that's life. I have taken the comments and I'm planning to resubmit it to another journal. So I would encourage you to take any training you can access in this area because you can always learn uh, something new. There's always something new to learn in this area. Okay, so I think that's all I had to say about publishing uh, in your own right. In terms of reviewing a paper for a journal, um, uh, this is the only slide I have. First of all, I would encourage you to let your PhD supervisors know that you're interested in reviewing a paper um, if the opportunity arises, because the chances are that your supervisors, because they are a little bit further in their career, are more likely to be asked. And also, they are more likely to not have time to do it. So. If you let your supervisors know that you're interested, then that could mean that they can uh, suggest you as a reviewer if the opportunity arises. And I have to make clear that usually it is PhD students who are a little bit more progressed with their PhD who are asked or who have previous experience of having reviewed a paper. So it's not something that immediately starts um, at the beginning of the PhD. And PhD supervisors are the best judges for that. So they are your 
mentors to start with. The second point is that most journals have book reviews, and I would encourage you to consider taking on a book review before you submit the paper, because it's a very nice way of introducing yourself to the review process. Um, usually you get to keep the book, so it's an extra book. Um, and if it's in your topic area, you haven't lost anything. You've read a book, you've written a review, and you have a publication, which is not an article publication, but it's still a publication, so it gives you experience. Um, if you're writing a review, uh, again, try to be balanced uh, in terms of the strengths and weaknesses of the paper, in terms of the big things and the small things. Sometimes I get a review which is like this long, and it's only about typos. And you think, uh, what about the rest of the paper? So it is important to be balanced and to have a balance between the big points and the small points. And usually one to two pages is enough. Try to be fair and constructive. Um, and remember that you're just making a recommendation. So the final decision rests with the editor. So you don't want to be completely extreme in your views uh, because the final decision will not be made by, by, by you. So you need to be as balanced as possible. Be on time, please. Any editor will tell you that because we rely on reviewers uh, completing these tasks on time. And you may not know this, but a lot of uh, journals actually allow editors to rank and rate the reviewers based on how timely they were with the review and also how uh, quality the review was. So behind the scenes, a lot of journals will, will, will give a, a grade to the reviewers. And that's important information for editors for the future. So you want to make a good impression. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, Again, reach out to your PhD supervisors for feedback. They are your first point of call throughout your PhD um, to give you feedback and to share their experience. And then finally, I would encourage you to write the review and then close your eyes and read it as if you are the author, just to make sure that any comments which might be uh, uh, received uh, harshly are kind of uh, rounded around the edges. So you can still convey uh, a strong message of acceptance or not, but the way you do it is really important because that written piece of work and the written feedback is there for the author to read again and again and again. So it's really important to be professional and just to make sure that all the statements are balanced. Um, so I think that's all I had. Uh, sorry, I've gone a little bit over time, Heather, um, and I'm going to stop sharing now and maybe invite questions 